Hello and welcome to 7 Days of Science. Coming up this week, two men talk about the science news. Starting off the news this week, a contract has been signed forming a joint European effort to build a space telescope to be launched in 2029. The construction of the telescope, named Ariel, will be headed up by aerospace company Airbus and led from the UK. One of the most interesting discoveries being made by ultra-long-range space telescopes at the moment is exoplanets, and unlike many other space telescopes, Ariel will be entirely focused on this task. Not only will the team behind this telescope hope to discover exoplanets, but its main task will actually be to work out the composition and characterization of the atmospheres of these exoplanets. A really exciting mission, but like I said, it's just a contract and launch is scheduled for 2029, so it will be a very long time before we get results back for this one. In other news, a study has been published in the journal Monthly Notices of the Royal Astronomical Society, which details findings on a galaxy 248 million light years away that has absolutely no trace of dark matter. The galaxy is an ultra diffuse dwarf galaxy and is about the same size as the Milky Way. It's called Dwarf Galaxy because it's extremely dim, and part of the reason for this is because it contains very few stars in comparison and far more gas. It's believed that dark matter, a still relatively mysterious form of matter known primarily from its role in expanding the universe, is what keeps galaxies together, especially galaxies like this one with so few stars. And yet, after stringent observation from astronomers, it was found that there is no trace of dark matter in this galaxy. The theory doesn't match with what we can see. One suggestion could be that much larger galaxies nearby stripped away the dark matter from this ultra-diffuse dwarf galaxy, but there are no such galaxies nearby. So far, there are no solid ideas as to why this galaxy doesn't contain any dark matter, so we'll be leaving this story as a bit of a mystery. Speaking of mysteries, now over to Ben, who is a mystery. Thanks, Doug. Well, some of the most exciting paleontology news that happened this last week was the naming and description of a new kind of ankylosaur, a very unique ankylosaur with a kind of tail weaponry never before seen in a dinosaur, essentially a battle axe as it has been described, or perhaps more accurately a makuahitl. A makuahitl! I don't know how you say that, but essentially an Aztec war club, the term suggested by the authors of this new paper. Meet Stegorus elangassan, a small 2 meter long ankylosaur from southern Chile that lived during the late Cretaceous period. The material this newly named animal is based on is almost complete and partly articulated, and its discovery in this part of the world during the late Cretaceous means that it was biogeographically related to Antarctica. The tail of this animal was truly unlike any other dinosaur we know of, with seven pairs of flat, sideways projecting osteoderms encasing the end part of the tail. Interestingly, Stegorus seems to display some stegosaur-like features in the skeleton of its body, while its skull has many ankylosaurian characters. It was found to be most closely related to the Australian ankylosaur Cunbarosaurus, as well as the Antarctic Antarctopelta, with these three taxa forming a newly established group of early diverging basal ankylosaurs together, named in the paper as Parankylosauria. It's an absolutely incredible and unexpected discovery that tells us so much more about this bizarre dinosaur group, and demonstrates that they were even more diverse than we'd realised. Lots of ankylosaur news recently, not that I'm complaining. Also in the news of this last week is an interesting paper naming a new genus and species of enantionothene bird from China with a hyper-elongated tongue. Named Brevi rostru avis macrohyoideus, this prehistoric bird was found in Lower Cretaceous rocks in northeastern China and preserves a particularly long hyoid bone, a bone in the neck that supports the tongue. This element, which is only just shorter than the length of the skull itself, is therefore interpreted as evidence for a specialised feeding mode in this animal and a hyper-elongate tongue similar to those seen in modern hummingbirds, woodpeckers and honey-eaters. It's a really interesting discovery, it's a shame there doesn't seem to be any paleo art of this bird yet, it's definitely a missed opportunity for some interesting reconstructions. Back to Doug in the studio. Thank you, Ben. Well, that's it for this week's Seven Days of Science. I do hope you enjoyed, and we'll see you on Sunday.